frequency. Now I need to move the transcription, stop the transcription. So we're just recording. OK, well, we're one minute past six now. Um, I'm Nicola Wilberforce, Director of Progression Guidance at Isha College. Um, I'm actually currently um, suffering from COVID. I've taken several paracetamol and had a cup of coffee um, to try to get through this, but I won't be speaking very much. Very much. Um, because I'm really glad to welcome Laura Cragg from the University of Manchester. She is going to be presenting to you um, a few housekeeping rules to start with. If you've just joined us, if you could make sure that your cameras are off and your um, microphones are off. So the only person who has a camera on will be Laura. So um, that will just make it a lot simpler and it'll be easier. So. I think we've got somebody trying to turn their camera off. That's great. Um, and I just wanted to say that we're really glad to have, once again, a really big uh, um, high status university, from the University of Manchester with us today. Um, Manchester is one of the bigger universities in the country. It's very popular with our students. We have a lot of students from Isha College who go to Manchester every year. Um, and whilst a lot of what Laura will say is applicable for any student writing a personal statement for any course, any university. Um, one of the things that we're very happy for uh, university student recruitment and liaison people to do is obviously emphasise the special attributes of their own university. And I'm sure at some point Laura will give Manchester a, a good plug. Um, just again to remind you, we have got um, the opportunity for you to ask questions, so please put those in the chat at the side. But um, we could well have students on the call as well tonight. Um, students will tomorrow on After Isha Day get their own version of this talk. It'll be um, in the College Theatre as one of a carousel of activities they'll be doing. And perhaps as a parent, if you could encourage your student to make sure they get to college on time, um, if they have a tablet or a laptop that they can bring that with them as well, because we have a we're fairly tight on providing students with IT access for various activities tomorrow. So any students who can bring their own laptops or IT with them, that would be great. And a number of students have been asked if they could bring headphones because they will effectively be in a Teams meeting in one of the sessions as well. So if everybody could have uh, cameras off, I'm now going to hand over to Laura Cragg from the University of Manchester. Uh, to deliver a, call, uh, a session for parents, in effect, on how to support their students writing a great personal statement. Thank you very much. I'm just sharing my uh, presentation now, so hopefully this will come through. Yep, yeah, so I'm hoping you can all see that. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Nicola. Um, welcome to, to this presentation. Um, my name's Laura. I work at the University of Manchester and my role is a student recruitment officer. I also do quite a lot to do with widening participation and access and work with current students as well in the in the student ambassador scheme. So current students who support us with our activity. Today, though, I'm here to talk about university applications, particularly with a focus on personal statements and how you can support your students in applying for higher education courses. I'll start off by talking about the UCAS process, what it is and um, what the application process involves. We'll spend the bulk of the presentation talking about the personal statements, providing some tips and guidance and a suggested structure as well. And then looking at references and further things to consider before I talk a bit more how you can engage with the University of Manchester. If any of you on the call are um, parents, carers and supporters of students who are interested in, in Manchester, there are ways to engage with us both in person and virtually. And I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions specifically about Manchester as well, if that would be useful. I've. Uh, obviously shared my screen now. I'll be working through the presentation and I do have a, a video to show as well. If there are any questions, the likelihood is I'll, I'll probably do them at the end. It just seems to, to make sense um, to, to answer them at the end. Uh, but do feel free to, to post them in the chat or, um, you know, however, however it usually works. 
so to start things off, I'll give you a bit of an overview about what UCAS is and the application process. So UCAS is the organisation that's responsible for managing higher education applications in the UK. But not only is it where you apply or where your students uh, will apply and track their application, so that'll be through UCAS Hub. It's also a guide and it's a really integral part of the decision making process. UCAS is a totally unbiased guide for students, for, for people like myself in, in outreach roles and also for parents and advisors and, and, and teachers. So not only is it the, the method in which your, your students will be applying to university, it's where they can find out the vast array of courses that are available in the UK and the number of institutions. So there are around 40,000 courses available at uh, over, 300 and, uh, over 300 higher education institutions within the UK alone. So it's quite a big decision. There's a lot to, to consider and a lot to, to take into account. But I think UCAS can be a really good starting point if any of your students are feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the decision making process. As we talked about earlier, universities, you know, we'll put lots of lovely sunny pictures on our on our websites and, and prospectuses and things like that. And university websites are great. They're really good to, to get a feel for a place um, until hopefully the, the student can come and visit. But UCAS is a really good one stop shop to find out, well, I'm interested in this course. Where is it offered? Um, and is a good um, starting point for when students are feeling just a little bit overwhelmed with the decision. So the application form itself, it's an online application form through UCAS Hub. This is for 2023 entry. So it may well be that some of your students are considering applying to university in 2024 and deferring a year. The dates and information we have at this moment in time relates to 2023, but it usually mirrors year on year. It's usually around about the same timescales. When we get to that stage, I'll, I'll um, give, uh, give you an indication. Students have up to five choices and then four for medicine, dentistry, veterinary science. And if they're thinking of applying to Oxbridge, so Oxford or Cambridge University, they can only apply to, to either or. So they can only uh, they can only apply to, to Oxford or Cambridge, sorry. And in terms of costs that are associated with the application process, it's £22.50 for one choice or £27 for multiple courses. And then for the application form, there are several sections to be completed by the, the students themselves. And I'll, I'll give you a, a bit of an overview of, of what that is in a moment. And then sections for, for school or college staff to complete also. So here's a um, screenshot of UCAS Hub. Um, this just gives you an idea what they will see or roughly what they will see when they um, register with UCAS. So you can see that there are um, apply and track. There's apply and track information on the right hand side. There's events that are taking place around the university, key dates and deadlines um, and lots of other um, bits of information that the students can can gather and find out from UCAS Hub. And then again, this will give you a bit of an overview of um, the different parts that make up the application form. So in addition to the um, things that you would expect, like personal details and, and, um, and whatnot, there is a section for the personal statement, a section for choices and a section for the reference as well. And the dashboard, the system will give the student an idea of how far into the application they are and how much they've got left to do. Um, so as you'd expect from any application form, we'll be getting um, contact details and information. The only part of the application form that is in the student's voice, so to speak, that the student has kind of autonomy over is the personal statement, which is why we want to spend some time today talking about how um, the, the advice that we would give and also how you can support your, your students as well. OK, I've just got a message through here saying that you can't see my screen. Is is that correct? Can I just check, Nicola? Can you see the screen? OK, I, can. I think most people can. can. We, we can see your face, but we can't see what you're showing us. So if you were showing us UCAS, we couldn't see it. 
Right, I think I think that's something which you might have to do your end. That's how you've I got can team cancel, set up. I can cancel my screen sharing and try again. If it's yeah. just, let's just see um, if we can do. I think most people, most people can. I think that's something which probably the attendee needs to sort out um, individually. I know that there's a there's a, a view mechanism which you can change on Teams. So if you go to I'll try as well and just do this this way because I think yeah. it was in presenter mode and I'm excuse the uh, <laughs> sudden move through the slides but I think so I can't see yeah that's, we got that's there, fine yep yeah. so I and can't I think, see I think the, the person who needs yeah. to change it needs to go to the three dots at more and change um the focus okay yeah. great I'll carry on for now I can't see the chat for now in this format but if um just okay. uh, uh let me know if there's any um any other issues so in terms of key dates and what you need to be looking for for 2023 entry and thinking about when it comes to your students. The UCAS um, application has is is live and um, but applicants can't submit their form until early September. So September 2022. There are two key deadlines to think about when it comes to actually submitting an application. Um, I do want to stress, though, whilst these are really important deadlines, do please stick to the deadlines that uh, the college um, are uh, put in place. So encourage your, your, your the young people um, in your life to, to work towards the college deadlines because teachers have lots of references to write in support of their students. They will set earlier deadlines um, so that applications are submitted in a timely manner. What we do tend to find, particularly for the January deadline you can see on the screen, is that the advice is to get it in before Christmas, just so that the, the students can enjoy their break, don't have to worry about um, a, a panic about doing it in January, particularly if there are any exams taking place then as well. So there's an earlier deadline of the 15th of October for medicine, dentistry, veterinary science and Oxbridge applications. And then the main deadline for all other courses is the 25th of January for 2023. So it's always the final Wednesday in, in January. This is called the on-time application deadline, the equal consideration deadline. I'll talk a bit more about what that is later. Then at some point in May, university decisions uh, should be um, issued on applications that have been submitted by the 25th of January. So um, I think it was around the 19th of May in 2022 and we will get confirmation of the, the 2023 date. And then for June, I think it was the 9th of June this year, it's the deadline for applicants to reply to their university decisions. Uh, so it'll be similar in 2023. So as I said earlier, if the student in your life is applying for 2024 is or is deferring a year, these dates will, will differ slightly. This is just for the next cycle for, for September 23. The way my job works is I'm always a, a year ahead of everything. So I'm already thinking about 2023 because the, the, the work that I do in my outreach role is with year 12s at the moment predominantly. So I said I'd talk about the equal consideration deadlines. A, a key factor to, to remember is it's not a first come first served process. So whilst we do encourage students to get their applications in as soon as possible and focus on, on working towards getting the, the best grades and, and meeting the requirements of their offers, it's not a first come first served process. If you get or if your, your um, a child gets their uh, application in, by October the 25th, they and for the January deadline, they're not going to be considered any earlier than somebody who gets it in on January the 17th. So we do encourage students to get it out the way, and um, all applications are considered equally regardless of the submission date. And worth noting at this stage as well that us, along with other universities, we always offer more places on our courses than the number available because we're aware, obviously, that our offer holders will apply to other universities. They've got up to five choices. So we know full well that um, not everybody who applies to us will will uh, choose to come here and choose us as one of their as their firm or their insurance choice. 
So in terms of the submission process, you register with UCAS, apply by the relevant deadline for the for the student, wait for offers to come in and then reply to those offers by the deadline in June. And then obviously find out on results day if you've met the conditions of those offers. So often that is the uh, meeting grade requirements, for example, or if they've been invited to interview, first of all, it's getting through the interview process and then and then waiting for for um, meeting the grade requirements. And I wanted to touch on clearing before we worked uh, through the personal statement part of the presentation, because clearing is the process of how universities fill any places that are still available on courses. And the UCAS website will have all vacancies, and these are courses that are, and um, these are the only courses that are available um, that are open in clearing and adjustment. So if there's no courses on on the UCAS website, then that course hasn't gone into clearing that year. It might not be the case that entry requirements are reduced, so it's not necessarily a kind of right. We need to make sure we fill these places. Let's just let anyone in. And um, we want to make sure that students can cope with the demands of the course and meet the requirements of the course. There may be some um, flexibility, particularly if a student has done an extended project qualification. Sometimes what you can find is that during clearing, that can be a really useful additional piece of information. If the student perhaps has just missed um, the, the requirements, the, the, the grades that are required for that course, but they've done an extended project qualification, that could be taken into consideration. The advice that I think is really important to, to say to students is for them to take their time to make a decision um, if they've um, verbally um, accepted a, an offer or verbally um, or have verbal offers from the university. We'd encourage them to research the course and the university before submitting an application. We appreciate it can be a really stressful time clearing, but it's also a, a, an opportunity that if things don't quite go to plan on results day, all is not lost and, and there's there's other courses available. And I think um, for, for parents and supporters and carers, I would say to to almost be there as a calming presence with your with your students um, and encourage them to really think about is is the course right for them to look into to detail and is the university going to be right to them uh, right for them, particularly if they're moving as, away as well and everything that comes with with student life. So. Um, Hopefully uh, clearing won't necessarily be um, needed for, for the students in your life, but I think it's worth knowing that this option is there and it's a really viable option for people as well, um, depending what what happens. And, and I, I, you know, there's lots of um, ex in, in my experience, a lot of people have adjusted really well to um, the, the places that they've found in clearing and, and have made it work for them and made higher education work for them. OK, I'm going to move on now to talking about the personal statement and I'm going to stop sharing because I'd like to show you a video um, first of all before I go back to the presentation. So we did test the sound. In fact, I'll just stop that and make sure that I've shared it correctly. Yeah, include computer sound. Uh, so we did test this. And I'm hopeful it will work if I could get an indication that you can hear it in a moment when I've pressed play, that would be great. But I'm going to just give you a bit of an introduction. Some of our students are going to talk about how they've used um, the personal statement, but also our admissions tutors at the University of Manchester um, talk through their advice and top tips for writing a personal statement. Thanks. When we consider applications, we're interested in the academic profile, so what are your predicted grades. We're interested in your references, what, pe what do people say about you. We're really interested in your personal statement and why you want to study the course that you're applying for. In my personal statement, uh, I started off by talking a lot about why I had a real interest for the subject and why I had a passion for it. I think a really important part of the personal statement was then that I moved into talking about uh, extracurricular activities and what I had done to work towards what I wanted to study. As an international student, I think it's very important for them to see that you're passionate about the subject that you wanted to study, as well as going to a new place and learning a new culture and adapting to a new environment 
I wanted to be open-minded about learning new things. Do not put anything in your personal statement that you cannot back up. And also remember that your personal statement will be read by all universities to which you apply. So please don't make any specific mention of a particular university. Your personal statement is really important for any application to a vocational programme and especially that's true for an application to midwifery. We place a lot of emphasis on what you've written about yourself in the personal statement. Importantly, it needs to be written in good English as well because the personal statement is actually uh, capturing and demonstrating your written communication skills. Of course, also at confirmation, your personal statement might play uh, a role if you have marginally failed to meet the conditions of your offer. In my personal statement, I emphasize on the extracurricular activities that I did in high school, such as volunteering activities that I've done, as well as the reason why I wanted to go to the United Kingdom in the first place. When we're considering applications, the most important thing for us is to recruit students who are going to have a good chance of succeeding on our degree programs. The usual advice is to perhaps choose a firm offer which is slightly stretching you in terms of your academic abilities and your predicted grades, but of course choose an insurance where you're, you know, you're pretty confident that you will get those entrance grades even on a bad day. Okay, so thank you for listening to that. I'm going to reshare my screen now back uh, to the presentation. OK, hopefully you can see that OK and we'll move on to the personal statement. So in terms of what admissions tutors are looking for, so the people that will read the students' personal statements will be based in the faculty or academic school of the subject that they apply for, the degree programme they apply for. They will be members of staff who will know the course inside out. They will know what they want to see in a potential student and have experience. In some cases, there will be teaching staff as well who are reading it. Um, but certainly in, in any case, it will be staff who, who are really familiar with the course and um, know what they want to see in a, in a potential student. So they will be looking at students having an understanding of the course that they're applying for. It sounds like a really obvious thing to say, but apparently, according to admissions tutors, that comes through really strongly if the students haven't done their research. So the next few months um, is really critical time, but also um, there, there is still plenty of time before September and before um, UCAS applications open. So I'd really encourage students to, to delve into the course that they're interested in. And wherever they're applying to, there'll be familiar and similar skills, knowledge and experience that's required for that particular course. Have they grasped what it would be like to study this course at university and how can they convey that in their personal statement? How can they demonstrate that from their current experience, they've got a real understanding of what the demands of, of higher education will be? They'll also be looking at students having the potential to study at a higher level. At this stage, at level three, they're working towards their A-levels. No, admissions tutors appreciate that, that, that and they certainly don't want students who know everything about a course and know everything about a particular subject because that's the whole point of going to university. It's to learn, it's to expand their knowledge and to follow a, a particular passion of theirs. So how can students show that they've got the potential to take that next step and to be an independent learner and to take initiative and take autonomy of their learning um, as it's a very sort of self-directed process um, going to university? There's obviously lots of support from tutors, from peer study, from um, different module leaders, but it is a very independent experience. And on that note as well, how can they demonstrate that? So they'll be looking at um, how students are currently independent and how they'll be building on that when they're at university. So again, uh, do they uh, take part in an extracurricular activity and take a leadership role? Have they um, adjusted to, to moving from year 11 up to, to sixth form? How can they show that they're independent and that they'll, they'll cope with that another step um, of independence when they're at university? And then finally, Admissions tutors are looking at what contribution they will make to university life. And I think it's really key at this stage to say that, yes, whilst academic 
studies and the academic side of things is a really crucial part of the personal statement. It should be the main part because that's what admissions tutors will be assessing their suitability for the course. They also want to know what else the student is involved in and their what makes them a rounded in, individual. What are their hobbies and their interests and will they continue that when they go to university or expand on that um, when they go to university? So how do they assess this? What evidence do they look at? So on the application, there's a space for predicted grades and that will be that a, forms a big part, obviously, of the offer making process, because that's at this moment in time what we've got to go on. It's the predicted grades, but then the academic performance to date as well. They'll be looking at, at previous um, results and, you know, we appreciate the last few years have been a really um, challenging time. Um, but again, everybody's in the same boat and the teacher reference will be used as well if there's sort of any specific information that needs to be be highlighted. The personal statement will be considered. And again, just to reiterate, this is the only part of the application where it's in the student's voice. So we um, like to give as much advice as possible, you know, directly from our admissions tutors about what makes a good personal statement. And I'll come on to that later on in the presentation. So I've said already the reference and I'll talk a bit more about references later, but usually the way it works is that there's a personal tutor who will provide a almost a, a character reference for the student, a bit more general, and then they're, they're subject tutors. So their A-level um, subject tutors will, will provide a paragraph on the, on the student for, for each subject that they're studying at the moment. Then the other two in yellow, this will be dependent on the course that your student is applying for. So there are admissions tests that are an additional stage to the process, particularly for law, uh, for law in some cases, although not at Manchester. And at Manchester, we have the UCAT for dentistry and medicine. There's also the BMAT that some universities use as well. Then there's an interview process for some courses as well. Now, I really want to stress here that interviews aren't designed to, to trip people up or, or, or to trick anybody or it's not a, a test, so to speak. Some interviews are combined with a visit day to give students an opportunity to actually come and find out if if the university is right for them. And that's the way that I always suggest students look for it. It's a two way process. It's for them to find out if we're the right place for them and, and, and for us to find out if they're the right student for us. Uh, so it's those can be two additional parts of uh, evidence or, or uh, bits of evidence that are considered in, in terms of making a decision on, on an applicant. How's the personal statement used? So it can be used during the interview process. So a really top tip here is please encourage your students not to lie in their personal statement and say that they've read all the works of Charles Dickens, for example, and then for, for them to be queried and, and sort of quizzed on this in their interview and, and for that to come undone. So um, personal statements are used as a basis for, for interviews in some cases. So something to bear in mind. They can be used to help us differentiate between applicants as well and certainly provide detail about an applicant's academic background. And if the academic background is quite similar, then going to the personal statement to find out more about their motivations of studying the course and what experience they have, if that's relevant and the skills, knowledge and experience they can offer. It can be used during the clearing and adjustment process as well. So when it comes to assessing whether or not students um, are suitable for a, a vacancy, suitable for a place in clearing and advising students as well. It's been used in the past, for example, uh, in clearing when a student has perhaps um, applied for a place, but there's a more suitable course or there's a course that admissions tutors think actually they would be quite suited to um, because they're looking at the personal statement of what they've said. Um, so it can be used in that way as well. And that final point there about the an additional statement. Some schools actually ask for an, and when when I say schools here, I mean academic schools in um, in a university setting ask for an additional statement to give you an example from Manchester. Our medicine department ask for something called a non academic information form, and that is because the personal <coughs> statement has a word limit of 4000 characters or 47 lines, whichever comes first. And if we, we often think, particularly for a course like medicine, which is popular, that the this non-academic information form is a bit more specific to Manchester. You The idea of a personal statement, as was mentioned in the video, is that it's general. It's going to up to five choices. So 
obviously avoid expressing a real desire to go to Sheffield if you're also applying to University College London or Edinburgh or um, uh, University of Central Lancashire. You know, it, it's got to be a general statement. Um, so for medicine, we ask for a non-academic information form, which gives the students an opportunity to expand on what they've put in the personal statement, but also explain a bit more why they want to study at Manchester, because they don't want to be putting that in their main personal statement. The personal statement then should include the following things, and I'm going to provide a structure a little bit later on, a, su a suggested structure, again for that starting point when you have a blank page in front of you, and I'm sure we've all been at, in that position where we've had to write essays or reports or or anything like that where you just need a, a, a starting point. Um, so I'll, I'll come on to the, the framework in a moment, but the personal statement should include any further qualifications the student has. Have they done Duke of Edinburgh? Have they done a sign language qualification or a first aid qualification? Is there anything else um, that they've completed and done? It could be outside of school or college as well. That would be worth putting in. Um, but crucially, what have they learned from it and the skills and experience that they can bring to the course? And outside interest as well, it certainly shouldn't be the main part of the, the application. It shouldn't form the main part of the personal statement, but it's always really good to talk about what else the student does. So do they have hobbies and interests and sports that they'll perhaps want to continue when they get to university? Do they take part in campaigns or are they a budding student journalist or um, DJ, whatever it is? Um, we do certainly like to get a taste of what the student's interested in. Also, their aspirations. How do they want to use the, the degree programme? What do they want to go on to do? And any work experience and volunteering. Now, again, due to the last couple of years, we know it's been really difficult to get work experience and it's certainly unreasonable for us to expect that um, students in, in, in some cases will have lots of work experience under their belt. So there are other ways of expressing um, the uh, for, for certain courses where there's a requirement for work experience, like medicine, for example. So if a student has some booked in, but it's after the 15th of October deadline, it's absolutely fine to talk about it in that way and say their um, intention is to, to carry out work experience um, post 15th of October. Also, if they've done any virtual activity or, or taken the initiative to get involved in, in online taster sessions for medicine or whatever it is, then definitely include that. But you can make work experience and volunteering relevant as long as they talk about skills. And then academic and personal abilities. So grades um, to date and what they've really or what they currently really enjoy about their courses and how it how the courses perhaps link together and what is their motivation for, for choosing that course, probably because they're studying it at the moment or they're studying a part of, uh, you know, subjects that could lead into a particular degree programme. So what is it about the, the their current studies um, that have made them want to choose the, the route they're going down? And yeah, obviously reasons for choosing the course as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about how to start off a personal statement too. So this is an exercise that we do with young people when, when I go out and about into schools and colleges or do virtual presentations. This is an exercise we encourage them to do and I wanted to, to, to show you it so you've got a bit of an idea as well and I'll share a worksheet a bit later on. We know that um, and I'm sure a lot of us have applied for jobs and it's uh, and, and put applications in and it's it's not great if you're reading applications as well when you just have somebody being descriptive and just telling us uh, you know, what they've done. Um, you need to constantly back it up. You need to show evidence of that skill that you have or that experience. And it's the same with the personal statement. And we recommend students uh, do an activity called the ABC activity, where before they write their personal statement, they think about the examples they're going to use and think about not only telling us what it is, but what they've learned from it, the skills they've acquired and how it relates to the course that they're applying for. So as an example, when I was um, year 12, uh, many years ago now, I um, worked in Clark's shoe shop. I was a, it, it was a part time job that I had. I applied to do English literature at Newcastle. If I just left it there um, without any sort of backup, uh, that wouldn't really give the admissions tutor much indication of my um, suitability for, for studying that course. 
However, it was a very busy store. I had to work in a team. Um, I had to work with lots of different ages as well, from you know little toddlers getting their first shoes all the way up to their grandparents. And I had to manage my time effectively because I wanted a social life. I wanted, I had college work. I had to go to college and um, had to study as well um, and earn some money. And that was relevant to my course because I did a lot of group work. I um, worked in a um, in, in team for group projects. I had certainly had to manage my time while at university as I had quite a lot of independent study time. Um, so I had lectures and seminars, but also had to ensure I was managing my time effectively and um, having a social life as well. So we talk about skills in this way to ensure that students are constantly questioning and reminding themselves why am I including that in my personal statement you can talk about a project that you did at college or some volunteering that you did or something that you, they did on um, they did on holiday or a um, uh, a hobby or a sport that they're, they're interested in and you can make it link to the the application as long as as long as they're talking about the the skills that they've gained acquired and improved so again, we work through with them um, the kind of skills that they might have. And I think just reminding them that, that they are constantly honing these skills as well and improving them. And that it will vary from student to student. So uh, a humanities student, for example, might have a different set of skills that they will need to demonstrate than a science student. Um, but it's, <clears throat> it's more about doing their research, looking into the course profiles, it is all there. Universities don't hide these things away. It might involve a little bit of digging on university websites, but just finding out what they're looking for in a, in a student and ensuring that that matches up in their, in their personal statement. So we don't necessarily recommend that they transpose everything in this activity into a personal statement, but it's a really good starting point to get them in that frame of mind of, of basically bigging themselves up and saying, well, this is why I would be an excellent candidate. This is why I would be a, um, uh, this is what I would bring to the, to the university and to the course. So this is the structure I was talking about, and we suggest this. It's by no means anything that's that's set in stone, and we know that it's it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a personal statement, so it will be personal to the student. But again, this can be something useful to work through with the young people in your life if they are struggling to know where to start. And I understand that they've got a really um, good program of activity coming up anyway this week um, at the college. So it'd be it'd be great to um, find out how they get on and um, see what they what they come up with as well. So. Initially, um, we suggest the introduction and conclusion should have roughly the same weighting. So the size of the boxes on the screen indicates how much weighting we recommend giving to each section of the personal statement. Uh, the main part should be their skills, knowledge, experience. Um, what do they have? How can they demonstrate these skills that the course requires? So further reading, for example, or project work that they've done at college. How can they demonstrate through their through their experience why they'd be a good candidate? You know, what have they done to date um, that, that makes them a suitable candidate? Then the work experience, the voluntary work, the part time work section, this might be bigger for, for those of um, for those students who are considering a more vocational course. So if they've managed to get work experience, for example, and it's really relevant, then definitely put that in there, make, encourage them to include um, work experience. It can be really valuable um, and certainly more generally voluntary work, part time work provides a, a wide array of transferable skills that are useful. Um, but for some for some students, this section um, might not really exist or, or certainly might be a bit smaller um, it will just be dependent on the, the, the requirements of the course. And then, as I said earlier, the, the additional sort of skills they can offer and, and what makes them them? Why, why are they unique? What other qualifications, activities, um, experiences have they had that they can talk about? And then in the conclusion, it's worth noting not to, to repeat anything that you've already said in the in the personal statement and be quite concise in rounding it up um, and having that structure and really thinking about a well thought out structure with themed paragraphs so that the admissions tutor can see that they've they've thought about this. They've not just sort of cobbled something together to get it in for the deadline. They've really thought about it. 
So a good personal statement has a strong introduction and conclusion. Um, it's original, interesting and enthusiastic and um, varying the sentence structure as well. It's very easy for every sentence to begin with I, but it's, it's a personal statement. It's about them. They are the experts in, in writing this personal statement because it's about them. But I really encourage students to, to try and stay clear of, of, of using I all the time. It's quite monotonous to read. And I think, you know, we want um, uh, personal statements to be unique and interesting and original. Uh, this is certainly one for me as an English graduate. Uh, be selective and don't waffle. Um, it is easy to do, um, but it's also worth writing more. So if they do come to you or to, to teachers with a, a really long personal statement, it's often around about 4,000 characters, 47 lines can be around about just over a side of A4. It is much better to, to have more and to cut it down than the other way around. So um, don't uh, worry too much if they've really gone on a bit in the personal statement because, um, you know, teachers and advisors can work with them to, to, to cutting that down. Then using quotations is something that's a little bit uh, gets a bit of a mixed response, shall we say. I think we do <laughs> recommend that students talk about their own experiences. They use their own sort of personal experiences. Um, so when we see quotations from other people, um, it, it sometimes can come across a bit cheesy. If they really do like that quotation, it's really motivated them to study a particular subject. Great, but just a bit of a warning, I would say. In terms of the thesaurus, whilst we like students to sort of mix up the vocabulary and vary their sentences, um, make sure they know the words that they're they're including and it sounds like them because that can be quite apparent when people are interviewed and, and the personal statements got lots of words that they perhaps wouldn't usually use. You know, we do want to hear them. Um, we've talked about making things relevant, so academic courses and skills and project work and also extracurricular activities So constantly thinking that ABC method. Why is it being included at this stage as well? The student is applying for the course. They're applying to study mechanical engineering, not to be a mechanical engineer. So just worth bearing in mind that actually. Um, do they know what the course is about, let alone the career? Do they know what the demands of the course will be? And is that coming across? And again, that final point of us wanting to know who the student is and why they're suitable for the course. I want to um, show you this slide. It is from a number of years ago, but I still find it really relevant as it's from one application cycle. And you can see in the white boxes, you've got a uh, opening sentence for a, a, a particular personal statement. And in the blue box on the right hand side, it's the number of times that that opening sentence appeared in personal statements in just one application cycle. So this goes back to the point we were saying about making it original, unique, personal to them. There's nothing wrong with these opening sentences at all. In fact, I think mine perhaps started along the lines of number four from an early age. I've always loved reading or, or something like that. There's, there's there's nothing that is that's that's incorrect and that 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 wouldn't um, necessarily be recommended. However, if the idea is to think of a statement that's going to be eye catching, you know, it's the it's the only chance they have to talk about why they want to study that course. It is worth considering how they can open that personal statement in a way that's that's eye catching, memorable, unique. I also want to include some what not to do's. I will try and leave these up uh, for a suitable amount of time for you to to read them through. Um, and just talk to you a little bit about why some of these aren't certainly aren't recommended. So in terms of spelling and grammar and, and that side of things, obviously it goes without saying to, to draft and redraft and to double check and triple, ch triple check and, and do encourage your students to get somebody else to read it as well. Again, I'm sure we all do this, but I write a lot of copy for, for websites at the, at the university and, and certainly publications in the past. And the amount of times that my brain has 
encouraged my eyes to read what it wants to to read rather than what it actually says and I'll give it to a, a colleague to have a look at before I send it over and comes back with with circles around things that I've missed because I've just had my head in a piece of work so much I think we can all um, relate to that and it's the same with this um so do encourage them to get somebody else to to read it and if it is yourself um you know think about reading it out loud as well so that you can understand where the pauses are and where the how it flows but that final one there at the bottom right um i think we can assume they're meant to say head boy not head bog but that wouldn't be picked up on a, a spell checker so really worth um attention to detail as an english graduate i do find the one on the left hand side quite amusing um but that kind of offending the the subject of english literature and the personal statement which should definitely be avoided um, and just the way that they come across it's not it's not great either um moving on i've got a few more of these for you that i will leave up a couple of others for, for not uh, what not to do. So that one on the right hand side, again, really stressing the importance of reading something out loud. The repetition in there is, is quite a lot. The punctuation isn't isn't right. Um, and it doesn't really make a huge amount of sense either. That top one there, uh, there's several issues here, but I'm the same in terms of putting notes on pieces of work to myself before I submit it, but please make sure they've removed those notes and certainly don't reference a university by name as we've talked about already because it's going to other universities. It may well be that uh, the students done outreach activity or whatever with a local university. That's great. Talk about that, um, but avoid expressing a, a desire to go to a particular institution. And then the bottom one's my favourite, I think, the bottom left. Uh, let's hope they meant to say martial arts and not marital arts. It's that classic thing of your brain wanting uh, to read uh, what it wants it to read. I want to just touch on plagiarism as in one year 234 personal statements contained this sentence ever since I accidentally burnt holes in my pajamas after experimenting with a chemistry set on my eighth birthday I've always had a passion for science so it's very clear there that this has been plagiarized that's a very um, specific event to happen not only when somebody was eight but on their eighth birthday not only was it a uh, um, a piece of clothing it was it was pajamas so clearly that's been plagiarized and it does happen um however personal statements are checked against um huge numbers of statements from the past those on websites and in books and um, there is a, a a copy catch it's the similarity detection service that ucas uses and um you can see there's some stats that in one application year there were um uh, significant numbers flagged as fraudulent um so just something to bear in mind if if they find something in a in a book or on a website or from somebody else who's applied before that they think's um uh, going to work well in their personal statement please encourage them to ensure it's their own work and that they keep it as their own work so final um bit from me is references and the reference is a really important part of the process it gives us further indication of the of what the student is like and also is an opportunity for the teacher to tell us if if there's anything we should take into consideration as well so it's really important that communication between students and and their referee is um is maintained and we always recommend that students let their tutors know what they're doing outside of the classroom if there is something that's really relevant so involvement in a particular scheme or organization or activity um, that might add to their um, add to their overall profile and a reminder really that teachers like to be positive just like the personal statement shouldn't be there shouldn't be any place for for negativity it's the same for the for the reference it's a supporting statement but they do have a duty to students and, and university choices to be realistic as well so again these are some steps that we suggest that students follow over the next few months particularly because they won't be submitting applications until september onwards to research their application um, to set themselves clear and realistic goals meet deadlines and make sure that form is accurate and is checked and triple checked and uh, to be available on results day so they can get the support of college and um, if they have to go through the clearing process that they've got 
um, people there who can support them and access to a phone as well to, to ensure they can get through to universities. I wanted to finish off um, with a little bit about how students can get involved in Manchester if they'd like to. So we have something called Unibuddy, which is an online app. Um, it's a WhatsApp style, a WhatsApp style app where students can chat with a current student. It's really safe. It's all anonymised and it's an opportunity for them to get an idea from from people who are currently at Manchester doing that subject, what it's like. Um, and you know, it's a really great resource, particularly because you're not just around the corner. So it's an opportunity to engage with us from afar. Similarly, we have um, another virtual opportunity here with our undergraduate webinars. We have a series of topics. The next one is on the 14th of July and it's actually going to be focused on student support. It's designed for any year 13 or year 12 students. Parents, carers, supporters are welcome to join as well. And we're going to be going through all the different support services that are available at the University of Manchester. And even if they don't come to Manchester or we're not one of their choices, universities will always have support services. Um, we felt it was really important, particularly after these last few years, to really stress and to bring into the, the forefront um, uh, of the students' thoughts, particularly those who are starting in September, what support will be available for them. And then finally, something called Manchester Connect, which we started during lockdown, but we've maintained because we were really missing those incidental conversations we'd have with students after presentations such as this, for example, in person or after higher education fairs or during higher education fairs. So we have 15 minute one to one chats over Zoom with staff about anything that they want to talk to us about higher education related. When I do them, I sort of introduce myself, but hand over to the student and say, how can I help you? And if we don't know the answer, we can certainly direct them to someone who does. So I'm going to um, stop sharing for now and thank you very much for your uh, attention over the last 50 minutes or so. Are there any questions that anybody has? I'm, I'm happy to to take any questions via the chat or if it if it works via the um just pop your camera on and your uh, your speaker as well no that's no problem at all they've never done what the students used to do in them in lockdown, lockdown which is log on log and then on go and off and do something else <laughs> <laughs> you, you, i'm going to point something out which you're probably not going to like um there was a spelling mistake on one of your slides oh and no and what's the an ultimate slide or so it, the undergraduate rem webinars it said undergraduate oh graduate, so. Wait, no, i should take my own advice shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I that's rather good it just does show that everybody oh um, well, there you go yeah the, my brain oh, is a good question uh, oh deferring a place yes Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, so in terms of deferring a place, you can, yeah, so what you can um, do is, there's, what we would recommend is, although it is personal to the students, so um, it is worth thinking this through, there is the opportunity of applying in the same academic year as everybody else, but then deferring that place um, because, for example, a student might get a job up, um, work experience or um, might have a gap year and get some experience that way. By being in the system, it means that they will be, they'll, they'll go through and they'll get the support. And I don't know how it works, Nicola, at, at Isha, but certainly we know it's a personal decision, but that's often what we would recommend to be in the system and to be known rather than applying perhaps when they don't have the support of a of a college. So I don't know if there's anything else you you want to add there, but there's certainly um, the. Yeah, I mean, students do do it. Students do it both them. ways. I mean, we would sort of say if you definitely know you want to have a gap year in some way, um, it's not a bad idea to apply. So, for example, if a student currently in six one or year twelve wants to um, have a gap year, they would actually be going to university in 2024. But we would suggest that they complete their application in apply 2023 and tick the box to defer entry, which effectively yeah. means that you apply now, but that you don't want to start for another year. Yeah. Um, if you can afford the £27, then we would suggest doing that. Yeah. If the results that the student gets are very much better than they had been predicted, and it means that the student could actually perhaps apply to a better university 
than they had originally done so. There's nothing stopping that student just withdrawing completely from apply 2023 with a deferred offer and effectively applying in apply 2024 after they've left Isha College um, with their better grades and they will get an offer probably a much, much quicker because there's no waiting for their grades to be come to, to come through. We still continue to provide support for um, former students. It's just a lot more tricky for them. I mean, we've been mm. helping a student apply who's had a second thought, had a deferred offer, decided she doesn't want to go to that university. We've helped her to reapply. The trouble is she's in New Zealand at the moment. Yeah. So, so the timings, you know, it's just been really hard. We've been dealing with her mother, who actually only lives opposite the college. Um, her family home is only opposite the college. But of course, the student is working at 12 hours out of sync with us. Um, so in a sense, it's a lot easier if the students do decide to apply post results. Um, if they do it relatively early on in September sort of thing, September, October, before they go off around the world on their travels or whatever, because it just makes it easier. But we do definitely still continue to support students. Um, in this last round of UCAS, we had a student who had left Isha seven years ago and wow. um, we, uh, you know, we, we, we continue to write her reference. So yeah. you never you never leave Isha, you just become a former student. Mm -hmm. um, we will always continue to support and to support the application to, to write a reference. Um, and, you know, if you do think your student wants to have a gap year, then they can sort of have two bites of the cherry. They can apply this year with all their peers when they're actually at college and they have time set aside to finish their applications and so on and tick the deferred entry box. But they could always, if they wanted to, even if they don't do that, they could apply as once they've got their results um, in the next round. And we have a special session. It's usually the sort of second Friday of the enrolment period, which we run for students who've just got their results who now want to apply to university or to reapply to somewhere else. So we continue to support students that way. Fantastic, thanks. Lots, of, well, lots gonna... of nice messages. I think I'll just finish by saying yeah. one final thing, which is that I think when, and I, and I think it comes from um, particularly what you were saying about the reference side of things, from our point of view, we obviously don't know students as well, perhaps, as uh, they might be known by uh, some of their teachers if they've stayed, for example, in a school with a sixth form. And we do have this uh, tool, Unifrog, which can be used as a research tool, but it can also it's also a really good place where students can record everything they're doing and then think about their sort of skills and competencies that they can then put together in their personal statement. They can actually draft their personal statement in Unifrog. Um, and the more they put down in Unifrog, the better the reference will be that their tutor is able to write for them, because we honestly don't know our students as well as they do in some other places where they've perhaps known them for a longer period of time. So we've got this opportunity for students to complete lots of stuff in Unifrog. Uh, as a parent, perhaps you could really encourage your student to do as much of that as possible, because the more that the student writes about themselves in Unifrog, the more the tutor can kind of really build up a good picture and write that sort of character reference at the beginning, kind of wrap up the reference at the end, because our, our references basically follow the same sort of pattern that Laura has described. You know, we have a bit at the beginning, um, the most, the majority of it is about what the students done in their academic subjects and how they've got those academic skills that we can show will make them good for studying those courses. And then anything that they've done outside or additional courses they've done at Isha. So our, our references are very similar to the personal statements. Again, we have to provide evidence for them, but the more that a student puts in, it helps us to um, make our reference sound as good as, as, as the student's personal statements. I'd just like to say thank you very much for Laura. It was a great talk. Everything that she said, I wholly concur with. I was putting little chats in just saying, yep, very good and all the rest of it. Um, we will have recorded this. So I'll stop the recording in a second. Um, but thank you very much indeed, Laura. I hope yeah, lots of welcome. you will be thinking of applying to Manchester or lots of your students will be thinking of applying to Manchester, along with uh, all the other great range of universities that we have in the UK. The final thing I'd just say is if any students are wanting to apply abroad, um, they will have to do that independently sort of through each university. There's no such thing as UCAS for abroad. Um, and I would like students who are thinking of applying abroad to liaise directly with me so I know who they are, because we have to get our heads around all the different application systems in all the other countries that they think to apply.
Thanks ever so much, Laura. And thank you. Thank you to the parents who joined us tonight. I'm going to stop recording.